Hello, my name is Bill Haley, and this is for Haley 2024 The Movement's Government Reform Ideas. Now, this video is going to be on real representation. Now, this might be the first video you, you are watching, but I am creating a new constitution for the United States, for the states, and actually for the localities as well. I'm changing the foundations of government, um, the radically changing the foundations of government's building blocks. Much more liberty, much more freedom, much more limited government with my base reform of competitive regulatory agencies. So this video is going to be strictly on real representation because I do not believe we currently have good representation. Um, our congressmen should not be called congressmen. Let's go through the video because I have a lot of this on the video. So, um, this, I just created a new U.S. Constitution, proposed amendment. Um, we'll go through the Article 5 um, system to try to pass it. I have, a, I have a political system to try to do that, if I can get that support. But right now, I'm just trying to show people that our current system is not good representation for government. And my system, my proposed amendment, is a much better system. So Haley 2024 is a set of um, government reforms, bringing most of what government is currently doing into the private sector, into the free enterprise system, or competitive governing agencies. So let's go through this. Real representation. Okay, let's talk about the current system. Current legislative representatives, congressmen, state legislatures, and the like, should not use the term representative. They it's just a bad term for what's going on there. To truly represent a person, to, to truly represent me and a guy down the street and the lady um, five, five streets over, everybody. To truly represent them, you must vote a person's interest. The representatives must vote that person's interest, their opinions, and to their benefit. No one person can represent 750,000 people as a congressman or 10,000 for a hundred thousand for a state legislative seat or 10,000 um, or 10,000 people for your locality. In those groups, you have socialists and you have capitalists. There are social conservatives and liberals. There are pro-war and anti-war activists. These people that want, there are people that want parental rights and education, and others that want robust government control of, of people's education and ch their children's education. Hundreds of issues have people on dozens of sides. There's not just two sides of war or not war. There's not just two sides of how to educate your children. There's not just two sides of how to deal with environmental policy. There's hundreds of, there's dozens of sides. And there's hundreds of issues out there. So there's no way to represent one person. My congressman currently, he might vote anti-war where I want war. Or where I don't want war, he might vote for war. He might vote for increased taxes. Well, maybe he represents my neighbor who wants increased taxes and me that wants reduced taxes. Or I might want the opposite. He cannot represent me and my neighbor together because I want something different than my neighbor. So we cannot represent us both because to, to truly represent me, you have to represent my opinion, my interest, and to my benefit. Congressmen, congressmen must either vote to declare war or not when there's a vote for it. He simply cannot vote for the interests of both the pro-war and anti-war. He has split, split his vote and says, I think 60% of my, um, the citizens within my district want war and 40% don't. And so I'll give 60% of my vote to pro-war and 40% against war. He can't do that. A representative cannot do that. It cannot be clearly stated that a congressman is representing it cannot be clearly stated that a congressman is representing the majority of the district. So let's just say, okay, 60% want war. Well, 
how do you know that 60% of the people want war? Because he voted for that congressman? When the people voted for a candidate, there are hundreds of real issues. A candidate might have gotten the vote because of his health care policy. So candidate, people vote on a lot of different issues. It might be on prison policy, health care policy, um, going to war or not going to war policy, tax policy, family law policy. There's a lot of issues that a candid, I mean, a voter might choose to vote on. He might like that candidate on 60% of the vote, 60% of the issues, and the other candidate on 30% of the issues. So his best option is to get 60% of his issues being represented, 40% not. That's if he wins the vote. And he might have wanted somebody else in the primary that might have been. Um, represented him by 70% of the issues. And when I say represent by 70% of the issues, somewhat agree with them because there's so many more sides than this too on the issue. I mean, on welfare issues, there's so many sides to that um, discussion. You can't just have two, either pro or anti. The vast percentage of the voters don't know the majority majority of a candidate's stated position. Okay, a, a president runs for 18 or 19 months for president. And I, I can guarantee you that half, the majority of the people do not know, could not answer six out of the 10 questions of what a candidate's stated positions are. And to be honest with you, the stated position of the candidate is usually not their position in the first place. It is this talking point, and they don't do what they say they're going to do. And most of the positions are not stated in the, in the first place. Much less for a congressman. Or do you even know you who your state legislative um, senator or state house of delegate member is? Do you know who your city councilman is? <clears throat> Can you name more than one or two of his policies or their policies? And whether or not they fulfilled their duties or fulfilled their promises, no, 80% of the people cannot do that. Even in the people who do vote, they can't do that. There's just way too many issues for a politician to become sufficiently knowledgeable to make good law. You just don't have the time. Suppose a politician took a full day every month to study six, 30 significant topics. One day he studies just prison policy. The next day he just studies welfare policy. The next day he just studies tax policy. The next day he just uh, studies um, family law policy. I'm sorry, that's one day a month. How much can you really know? You come into the job with, most politicians come into the job with very little knowledge about how, knowledge about how a prison works or knowledge about family law, but they're making law. They're writing words and putting those words into laws, and those lawyers have to interpret those words. Most legislators don't even read or even have a chance to read. They have a, a thousand page um, bill drop uh, four hours before they have to vote on it. There's no chance for them to even read it, debate it, amend it. We don't have a good system. Of course, campaigning takes half the time. And many legislators are part-time. For, for example, Virginia, part-time legislator. They, they, they go up there in January, February, March. But into March, into going into April, they're back running their businesses or working as an employee working as a lawyer, working somewhere else. Do you really think that they have the knowledge base to make proper prison policy, to make proper tax policy, to make proper um, gun laws and proper whatever, insurance regulations? They make insurance regulations down to the every comma and every um, capital letter and every, every little thing that the lawyers... Uh, go over with a fine tooth comb. They have no idea what they're even writing most of the time. And they're not even writing that 
you have outside groups writing it, and it gets dropped in front of them and say, vote yes or no. Not the best of systems, because they don't still have the knowledge. You break this into 30 different sectors and have a legislature just on family law or just on prison, and you, you, you're going to get a lot better knowledge so people, they can't get things over on them so much. So in the CRA structure, the separation of government into 30 sectors means that someone with a lifetime of prison policy experience will run for office in the prison sector. So if you're in the prison um, industry, not as a prisoner, but as a guard, as a um, person running the prison or, or consultants around the prison, and you, just, you have that experience of being around prisons for 30 years. You started when you're 25 years old after college, and you're just now you're 50, 55, 60 years old, and you have a lifetime of experience. You can really understand what's going on in the prisons, and you can make better policy, better law, because you know it. And people voted for you on your on their interest on prisons, because you ran just in that one sector. His campaign will focus on prison policy, and voters can make decisions based just on that set of issues. In the CRA structure, a citizen first selects a CRA. That's a representative body per sector that best matches their interests and opinions. So every prison CRA will put out its philosophy, and I will choose one that I like the best, my neighbor chooses the one they, they like the best, then within the like-minded membership of just their CRA, they'll send representation up to the legislative body or within their um, CRA, they will manage a prison the way their CRA wants to manage a prison. There's a lot to it. A lot of civil liberties goes into it. A lot of accountability goes into it. A lot of, it's not a free-for-all. There's a lot to it. But you'll, at least you have a lot of different ways being tried and expertise going in there. And if some if somebody does it badly, another another group can come in and take over and do it better. The citizens then vote because we're talking competitive here. We're not talking about a monopolized system. So a competitive system, if one person runs a prison good, one person runs it bad, there's a lot of civil liberty violations on over here but really good civil liberty um, protections over here, well, they're the ones with the, doing it right are going to get more business, more representation, more people supporting them, and they're going to be running more of the prisons. You're going to have a competitive nature, and competitive nature always makes a better system. It's not a free-for-all. Civil liberty is going to be um, a big into this. There's going to be rating systems that really stop abuses and really gives um, consumers and the citizens a lot of really good, high-quality information from a wide variety of perspectives. So let's go back to this. The citizens then vote with like-minded people for their representatives at both the CRA level and the sector board level. You need to know my system to know what the CRA, CRA level and the sector board level are, but what we're talking about is really good representation. Because if I have a certain view about how prisons should run, I can go to my CRA and they represent me, my interest. And if I don't like, if I don't like what they're doing, or they say bug off, I don't like, we don't agree with you, I can go to another one that agrees with me. My money goes with them. Money flows with my membership. My money flows with my membership. It goes through the better system or the way I want it to be run. And again, I can't just go with one that violates people's rights because there's other methods and other mechanisms to stop abuses. So here are the 30 sectors. And we'll go over all, all of them in a little bit better so you can see them a little bit better in a second. But here is the system. Here is how you get represented. You actually pick 180 different agencies, 90 CRAs, 90 um, RAs, 90 competitive representative agencies, 90 rating agencies, 
30 on the um, federal level, 30 on the state level, 30 on the local level. 30 on, on both sides, the CRA side and the rating agency side. So you get, you select your um, CRA with like-minded people with a like-minded philosophy. You like their mission statement, my neighbor likes another CRA with their mission statement and their philosophy. So my CRA represents me. Then if I want to go farther, I can go into the politics of my CRA and try to get um, the people I want elected. But there's going to be a lot of people, I say 90% of the people are just going to say, you better stay with your philosophy as long as you keep your philosophy up, your ratings up, good quality um, governance and representation up. I'll stay with you and if you start going bad, I'll switch. switch. But other people are going to like the politics and get in there and try to make sure, tweak a little bit here and there, but it's going to be within their philosophy. Conservatives will get together with conservatives, liberals will get, get together with liberals, and it's a lot more than just liberals and conservatives people. It is Green Party, it is Libertarians, there is so much more. A lot of people in the middle. So I'm predicting roughly 12 in each sector, 12 CRAs per sector. And then uh, only things that create um, significant negative externalities will be going up to the sector board level where they regulate across the whole board to stop a negative externality. But the rating system is going to take care of 90% of the negative externalities, if not more, and using rating floors. The rating system is going to be so strong in giving people good quality information and then stopping negative externalities with rating floors making sure somebody doesn't pollute too much or do some other stuff causing negative externalities that the competitive regulatory agencies are not going to have to push too much up to the sector board level. Now in some sectors it will originally be at the sector board level because there are societal oversight roles. I'll go over those. So we get rid of all government welfare, we go to a charity system and um, we mandate everybody gets 5% of their income or roughly 5% of GDP has to go towards charities. That's a lot of money. It's about $30,000 for the bottom 30% of the population um, per house, $30,000 $30, per household of the bottom 30% uh, 30 of the population. So it's a lot of money. But so there would be money in there, but it'd be very diversified. So a lot of um, charities going to have um, charitable distribution associations. That money is going to be d d much dispersed. Five in the foreign protection system, private military people, but we're going to have a com free enterprise military, but with a lot of controls. You have to ha to have governmental power. You have to re have um, representatives of seventy percent of the people vote to give you that governmental power of being a aircraft carrier, anybody in the military, aircraft carrier um, commander to the lowest private. You have to have the authority um, by the military capability, I mean, military authorization agency. So it's going to be hard to get that authority. So you, you're going to have to uh, mine, your, um, mine your stuff. You have to really not do abuses. You cannot go outside of the norms. You have to There'll be a commander in chief sector. There'll be a foreign policy sector. Then we're going, five sectors are in the violent crime mitigation system. Each one of those, have, what you think about um, what the crime, sh what the crime law should be, what the violent crime law should be, is different than the law enforcement. You, you have two different leaderships there. Two different ways of thinking about cops versus what should be the, the violent crime laws. Private sector courts people, private sector on prisons. But we have representation over all of this stuff so nothing gets out of control. Again, a law enforcement authorization, anybody who wants to be a judge, a prosecutor, um, a, a police officer, a lot of anybody with inherent government power, they need authorization from representatives of 70% of the um, people. So you cannot go outside of the norms. You cannot cause negative externalities. You cannot just be thugs out there 
and do whatever you want to. You have to be trained. You have to be doing things in the right way. You have to have internal affairs and the like. Your thoughts and your interest, your representation is going to be with each one of these sectors. The way you think about healthcare is dramatically different than the way you think about environmental controls and environmental protections. The way you think about human resources um, is, and taxes is dramatically different than what you deal with how you want to handle roads. And we're going free enterprise roads, people. How you deal with um, free enterprise social security and retirement. That's going to be in their insurance. And yes, we're going full free enterprise with that. Getting rid of social security altogether. How you deal with food and education and free enterprise education, guys. If you want to stay with the public school system, you can. There will be a public school system, CRA, that mirrors the current public school system. But if you want to be free and do free enterprise and private schools, you can do that too. But parents are going to have that chance. When you, right now, you elect your school board. How about you select your school board of one of 12? And some of the school boards are going to be totally private where they only charge you $15, $20 a year for a little bit of oversight and you pay for your own children's education. Other ones, you're going to be paying public school type of fees and taxes and, and the like. But they only tax their members. There's a lot to get into on that. There's a full responsible transition. Everything I'm talking about, every government, um, anything government's currently doing, it goes into the free enterprise system, but with controls, societal oversight roles. Some of these sectors are strictly societal oversight roles where they're not spending too much money other than salaries of people doing the societal oversight. So the fees are not that expensive. And they're just making sure they're not going outside of the norms and making sure they're not doing negative externalities. So free enterprise roads, guys, every, and that's a free, um, that goes into the, um, that's gonna help pay off the debt. All, every, every time we sell land, roads, schools, um, military equipment and land and bases and aircraft carriers, all that's going to pay off the debt, guys. When you sell mil um, police stations and police cars and and all this stuff and government land and e everything that government's currently doing, we sell to the private sector. Now it could be to the sector board, not the sector board, to a CRA. But all this is going to be paying down the debt. And we have a way of paying down all the debt responsibly. I mean, just the money itself, our current money is a disaster area, but we're going to switch over to free enterprise money. But there's liabilities and assets in that, and we deal with that. So, everything I've shown you is to show you this video was on real representation, how the current congressmen and state legislatures and all those people, they don't rep represent you very well, and how the system I'm trying to propose within this constitutional amendment and all my reforms are going to give you so much better representation. So please consider a donation to this um, video, I mean to the Haley 2024 The Movement, and look around the website at Haley2024.org, and until the next video.